How's everybody doing? Thank you. Privacy is awesome. Thank you to the crowd. Everybody give a big whoop if you care about privacy. OK, good enough. Uh, I'm Tor. I'm the founder of Secret Foundation. I'm talking about Secret Network. We're one of many organizations that help support the secret ecosystem. We have Secret Labs, the core development team. We have secret agents all around the world, some of whom are with us today in Miami, many of whom are watching now live around the world. Appreciate you joining. We're going to be talking about the fight for Web3 privacy, both from what Secret Network has been doing over the past years, but also just in general, the fight for Web3 privacy. We're going to start with the then, we're going to move to the now, and then we're going to move to the always. Before we get there, though, I want you guys to remember this. Throughout the whole time that I'm talking here, there's one fundamental thesis that we built the entire project around, that we have built our entire conception of Web3 privacy around. And that is decentralization needs privacy to succeed. But also, if we want privacy to be protected, we need decentralized systems. The systems that give us privacy must be decentralized. And if any decentralized system is going to be sustainable and secure, we need to be thinking about privacy at its core. So as I said, we'll start with the then. We'll go back in time for secrets specifically, talk about the genesis of the project, how long we've been talking about these issues. We'll talk about the project now, and then most importantly, we're talking about how we're iterating into the future. Everything we've built to this point is a foundation for what comes next for secret. But that core mission of bringing privacy to decentralized technologies and then, of course, ensuring that privacy technologies are decentralized, that's never going to change, no matter what technologies are used and no matter where we build them. I'm taking us back to 2015. The very first white papers that became foundational for Secret as a project were written. And they were written by Guy Ziskind, who's the CEO of Secret Labs, the core developers for the protocol. And the title of the paper was, this won't surprise you, decentralizing privacy. And the whole concept of the paper was that you could combine privacy technologies with blockchain technologies and get something that was much stronger than just something that was private but centralized or decentralized but completely public, both of which didn't seem to be useful. So unlike Bitcoin, Transactions in our system are not strictly financial. They're used to carry instructions. We were already thinking about essentially smart contracts, decentralized applications, and we could discuss future extensions to blockchains that turn them into solutions for trusted computing problems, not solutions for speculation, not solution for just you know, trading things of speculative value, but for solving actual problems, not becoming a solution in search of a problem. This became the foundation for everything that would happen going forward with the project. Meanwhile, also in 2015, this little network called Ethereum launched. And now we're starting to see blockchains that aren't just for peer-to-peer -peer transactions, but also for programmable smart contracts on the blockchain. But as anybody who's used Ethereum knows, we're still talking about a public by default blockchain. Every piece of data, everything about the address on that chain is going to be public to every other user every other observer. So into that ecosystem, some of the core members of Secret today began building Enigma then, which was designed at that point as a private compute layer that would sit on top of Ethereum. You have a public by default network. There's no privacy. How do you get it? The second layer solution. However, building as a layer two was still a limited solution, and there were a lot of technical challenges along the way, especially back in 2017, when barely anybody was even using a public blockchain. There were a lot of challenges trying to get this into production. No one had ever done it. At the same time, going forward a couple years now, other really innovative technologies start to launch. For example, Cosmos Hub. And now suddenly, people see that these alternative consensus mechanisms can work in production, not just proof of work, but proof of stake. And we get this idea of interoperability. Maybe blockchains should talk to each other. Maybe you should be able to have any blockchain anywhere, be able to send data to another blockchain. These are radical ideas. Finally, we're seeing some of them in production. But again, none of this has any privacy. Do we really want all these blockchains to talk to each other, sharing data everywhere, and there's still no concept of protecting data privacy? But suddenly, 
all the pieces are now in place. They're not put together yet, but they're there. There's this foundation for interoperability from Cosmos and self-sovereignty from being able to have a standalone blockchain. There's also this idea of programmability that Ethereum has introduced. And then there's still this idea of privacy by default that was introduced in the white paper that was being explored by transactional privacy networks like Monero. But this concept, this equation with all these pieces together could add up to the original vision of the project to have a platform that could provide decentralization and privacy and solve actual problems in the real world. So this became secret, and the vision is still the same. Can we have a privacy hub for all of Web3 and solve the data privacy problem for all blockchains? Every other blockchain in the world is public by default, especially if they have smart contracts integrated. That data is all public. Can we change that? Can we secure that? Can we fix what could potentially become a dystopian public by default data model, a surveillance capitalist nightmare? Could we fix it through technology? So in February 2020, now we're getting into more recent history, but still a while ago, by crypto years, we had a mainnet launch. September 2020, private smart contracts launched. That means we've now had private smart contracts, which can have encrypted inputs, encrypted outputs, which have run with an encrypted state have been on mainnet for more than two years. And Secret became the first decentralized network with privacy-preserving applications. And more than two years later, it is still the only network that has been able to achieve this in production. What's important about this is that it's a privacy platform, not simply a privacy coin. We've had privacy coins. We've had coins like Monero or Zcash that are designed to be able to send transactions from one party to another. But that's not the vision. That's not what we talked about when we talked about a platform for secure computation that could be global, could be decentralized. We're talking about any developer being able to build any application, any generalizable application, and to have it be interoperable, have it be secure, and have privacy for the data that gets used by that application. Meanwhile, the world did not stop. It kind of got worse. I can pull headlines from like any day of the week. This is just a random assortment of data breach headlines. You've got Uber, Alibaba, Equifax, and of course everybody now knows all of the things that were whistleblown by Cambridge Analytica, what they were doing, Facebook data, all of this going on in the Web2 world. Clearly we have a global privacy issue. Clearly. But then it got worse. And now you can see that it, it, it's not just an issue of like, oh, I had some data on some application, it might leak, some hacker might get my password, but I don't do anything important anyway. It's a human rights issue. It's not just a, I had some data somewhere and somebody might see it issue. We're now having laws in the US contemplated, like will there be a national abortion ban? What happens to the data about people who have sought those medical health services, or if they've used some sort of period tracker that is now selling their information to the government. We have a developer sitting in jail in the Netherlands simply for writing code for Tornado Cash, who still has not really been formally charged. It's also an issue in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. I could go on. There's a million cases where, again, these are privacy issues, yes, but they're human rights issues, and the slope is more slippery than you might assume. And I'm not speculating to say that it's getting bad or could get worse because it already is. The fight for privacy has been ongoing from the cryptography battles last century to what's been happening today. And we're just seeing it happen on new battlefronts. Even in Web3, suddenly there's been come this consciousness shift about what is the role of privacy? And we've been saying the same thing from day one. Privacy needs decentralization. Decentralization needs privacy. You don't get any other story from secret. But suddenly you're starting to see a realization in the public by default blockchain world that maybe we do need base layer privacy. Major thinkers, thought leaders, suddenly this is the big realization they're having on Twitter that we had six years ago. So we're not upset about this, we're actually celebrating. Finally people are starting to see the issue the same way we've always seen the issue. But it's not enough to talk about it. You actually still have to do the hard work of trying to build it pragmatically and iteratively and get these solutions into production. The point is that privacy is needed now. We're not going to need it speculatively someday in the future. We didn't only need it yesterday. 
We need these solutions today, not just for every Web3 technology, but for every technology. It's just that we know decentralization is the future. We also know privacy by default is the future. How hard can we work to have that today and get resources into building those solutions now so in the future we're not left wishing we had? It matters across every vertical. It's not like this is only something we're going to need for transactions or DeFi or NFTs or certain things. We need it for everything. Anything that people have been building in Web3 and everything you wish you could build in, depth in Web3 is going to require privacy at the base layer to be possible and to be sustainable and to be secure. At the same time, user experience matters. And usually when you have something that's privacy preserving, there's some user experience compromises and it's a little clunky and it's a little weird and it doesn't work as perfectly as Google or Facebook or anything else that's siphoning off user data and reselling it. Okay, but we shouldn't give up. We need competitively good UX for privacy solutions so that people can adopt them. We shouldn't treat users like it's a hassle to experience privacy. They need to celebrate being able to have that privacy while using the applications they want to use. We're going to have to fight for both. So with that in mind, we already have a lot of mainnet dApps on secret that are trying to solve for both UX and privacy and security all at once in production, building the plane on the way down because privacy is needed now. We're not going to wait in the future for mythical, perfect solutions. That's only found through iteration, experimentation, and trying to bring real solutions to real users and to get the best developers in the world to try to build them. So I'm just highlighting a few here. Sienna which is a DeFi protocol and platform. They do lending, they do swapping, they have a DEX. Alter, which is a communications platform for private messaging, another huge use case for decentralized tech that you just can't or should not build on a public by default blockchain. We have a big NFT ecosystem. Stash is our marketplace, the primary marketplace where you can create, buy, sell NFTs that have native privacy. If you're going to have assets that are social and scarce and important and valuable, why do you want them public by default? Why do you want them sitting in a wallet that everybody can see, making you a target? Why don't you give users confidence that their security is in their hands? And if they want to show off their NFT, they can. And if they don't, they can keep it secure. Those mental models make sense. It's just that we didn't build them because we didn't have a private by default foundation. And today, with Secret, you do. In the future, there's more. Our booth downstairs has only 25 of the DAP names on there. I'm only highlighting a few on stage, but so many more are coming. Shade Protocol is launching a number of applications, including a privacy-preserving stablecoin and stable swap. We've got Secret DAO launching, and uh, also PAX, as well as a DAO platform that's trying to bring privacy to DAOs, DAOs being a massive use case for Web3 tech. We have OneNet, which is building Bushi, and they're trying to become a privacy-first Steam for Web3. If you care about having true ownership of in-game assets and what democratization of gaming might look like, so do they, which is why all these apps are building on secret. We have more wallet support coming. UX is important. You can't just have one wallet. You have to have a dozen. You have to have a competitive experience for users who are trying to experience these applications. Fina, Leap, Starshell, there's already Kepler Live for a lot of applications on desktop, mobile, so you can easily get started with secret dApps. But this is only the end of the beginning. This is where we are. This is why we're here. This is how we got here. This is what's live. This is what's coming. But what's next? The most important part is what's next. Because privacy, again, all of this is iterative. What's good enough today will never be good enough tomorrow. What we've built to this point will never be enough for the user of tomorrow. It needs to be more private, more decentralized. And we're always moving in that direction. And as we move in that direction, we're asking questions we're iterating, we're fixing, and we're trying to get to the end state that we know we must, that we've known since 2015 we're trying to get to. Privacy, decentralization, needing each other, and finally having each other. Here's the vision. It's not just a privacy silo. We're not saying come to secret and never leave. We're saying can we be a privacy hub for all of Web3? Can we be privacy as a service for every other blockchain in existence? Can we bring our solutions to every chain that needs it. Every chain, other than secret, is public by default with their applications. They all need this. Can we be that provider? And there's a lot of technology that we're already building that'll allow for it, for cross-chain privacy-preserving smart contract calls, for interchain accounts, 
to be able to send private tokens on secret across many chains, not just throughout the cosmos, but everywhere in the Web3 world. We have a major mainnet upgrade coming on December 13th, Shockwave Omega, the third of three major mainnet upgrades that's bringing performance improvements, making things faster, user experience, obviously, not something we can compromise on if we want people to use what's been built. And that's only two weeks away. But maybe most importantly, other than this equation, and trying to unlock these 1,000x use cases, is the evolution of all of this. How do we evolve past the solutions we've already built? So secret 2.0. Everybody talks 2.0. There's an Ethereum 2.0. There's an Atom 2.0. All of these networks are always iterative. They always knew that there was going to be a transition, an improvement. Ethereum moved from proof of work to proof of stake. All of this involves complexity. It involves iteration. It involves a ton of technical work. But our destination has always been the same. How do we get more private, more decentralized? How do we secure everything that's been built? And the secret 2.0 vision is how do we add even more cryptographic solutions to what's already been built? How do we integrate cutting edge technologies like fully homomorphic encryption, multi-party computation? How can we use the best of what's been developed in the zero knowledge space to amplify what secret has already been a market leader on since those very first white papers in 2015? If you want to know more about that, my time is up, so I'm only going to direct you to Secret Summit. Take a picture. If you're watching one of these live streams, just go to the website right now, scrt.network slash summit. We do have some special rewards for people who RSVP early. Stay tuned for that. But go to scrt.network slash summit, RSVP. This is a digital conference. Show up, live streams, five hours of streams from the people who are building apps on Secret from the Layer 1 core devs from incredible thinkers across the privacy world, across the cosmos world, from everywhere. And you're gonna hear from all of them, not just me, about what makes the secret ecosystem great, strong, and why they believe so strongly in the ethos and mission that's brought us all together in the first place. So with that said, a few other calls to action. We have a grants program you can build on secret. We're launching an incubator as well, and you can become one of those awesome secret agents I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. There's tens of thousands of them globally advocating for Web3 privacy. One of them could be you. If you just go to the secret website at scrt.network, you'll see there. All those calls to action are there. Everything you could want to do with secret is there. We have a real, ish, a real ethos and a real mission in the space. We'd love for you to be a part of it. Check that out. That's me on Twitter. That's the network on Twitter. Discord is there with the chat link. I really hope to see you in one of these channels, and I really appreciate you listening to me talk about this. It's the thing you can tell I'm the most passionate about in the world, so thank you for giving me your time.